The following podcast is a ministry of Parish Presbyterian Church. Hear now the word of the Lord as it is found in Exodus chapter 20. God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. According to Pierre Vire, the Ten Commandments are both sequential and consequential. In other words, uh, there is a specific order. They begin with the character and nature of God himself, who he is, how he is to be worshipped. And then the commandments move to the necessary consequences Uh, beginning with uh, our relationships, our intimate relationships, uh, relationships within the family, its primacy, and and then uh, the sacredness of life itself and the call to moral purity. And then it finally moves into the realm of the heart of uh, covetousness, of discontent, and of the abuse of our neighbors because of that discontent. Today, we take up the Eighth Commandment. And it is one that should pierce all of our hearts. Let's pray. Father, I do pray that you would open our eyes both to the grievousness of our thieving hearts and to the great call that you've placed upon us to holy contentment. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Umberto Eco, the great Italian semioticist, uh, has said, the prohibition against theft is a universal feature of every law code from ancient antiquity. It features prominently in the Chaldean Code of Hammurabi, the Babylonian Stele of Ishtar, Nineveh's Code of Asher, the Hippocratic Corpus of Thebes, the Athenian Constitution of Solon, the Roman Corpus Juris Civilis, the Byzantine Code of Justinian, the Frankish Carolinian Law, and even Islamic Sharia Law. You can even find it, he says, in J.K. Rowling's novel, The Philosopher's Stone, in London's Diagon Alley at uh, Gringotts Bank, uh, we have emblazoned the universal and sober warning, enter stranger, but take heed of what awaits the sin of greed, for those who take but do not earn must pay most dearly in their turn. So if you seek beneath our floors a treasure that was never yours, thief, you have been warned, beware of finding more than treasure there. Echo goes on and he says, of course, all of these are likely derived from the headwaters of all human ethics The Mosaic Code, the eighth of the Ten Commandments. The grievous sin of thievery is actually a primordial vice. Adam and Eve defied God and then they stole what was forbidden. And ever afterward, thievery of all kinds has become a blight on both men and nations. We see this all through the scriptures. And when Isaiah, the prophet, brought his condemnation against 
the nation of Israel, he said, your princes are rebellious and they are the companion of thieves. Jose, the prophets put it this way, like a gang of thieves that stalk a man, your priests commit shameful crimes and you put up with it. Uh, Jeremiah said, has this house Uh, which is named by my name, become a den of thieves. And of course, Jesus in Matthew chapter 21 uh, repeated that saying, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Christ's condemnation of the Pharisees was, you Pharisees make the outside of the cup clean, uh, but inside... You are thieves, full of evil. And again, Jesus said, all that ever came before me are thieves and robbers. The sheep did not hear them. The Apostle Paul said, neither thieves nor covetous nor drunkards nor revilers shall ever inherit the kingdom of God. Thievery plays a prominent role In the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10, the story of the proud Pharisee and the widow's might in Luke chapter 18, uh, the story of uh, Rachel and Laban in Genesis 31, the story of Saul and Jonathan's demise in Gilead. The prophet Malachi accused the people of Israel of robbing God by withholding their tithes in Micah Chapter 3, and of course, Judas Iscariot not only betrayed Christ for 30 pieces of silver, but we are told that he was a thief because he used to help himself to the disciples' money. The Eighth Commandment, you shall not steal. It's found in Exodus chapter 20 and in Deuteronomy chapter 5. The Hebrew word steal, ganab, literally means to rob, to steal away, to defraud, or to capture. But as the Westminster Larger Catechism points out, it's a a very broad term uh, that embraces everything from injustice, unfaithfulness, extortion, bribery, usury, vandalism, vexatious lawsuits, the unjust withholding of whatever is due our neighbor, and man-stealing. Anything uh, that enables us to enrich ourselves at others' expense. But in addition to that, the term uh, can also be applied uh, to all the ways that we steal time from God. Idleness prodigality, wastefulness, improvidence, gambling, and gaming. Now, because such vices are native to our fallen nature, they are not naturally or easily eradicated. We are a discontent people. We're like the children of Israel in the desert. We're constantly whining and crying and complaining and murmuring because we're never content. And those discontented, restless hearts lead us to thievery. The Bible tells us uh, that as a result... Thievery is only overcome by the spirit-induced virtues and spirit-empowered disciplines of truthfulness, faithfulness, generosity, moderation, liberality, charity, and munificence, all of which are the spirit-fashioned fruits of holy contentment. In uh, uh, the wonderful uh, Puritan classic, uh, The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment, 
Jeremiah Burroughs says, contentment is a sweet inward heart thing. It is a work of the spirit, a very seasonable cordial to revive the drooping spirits of the saints in sad and sinking times. It is a gracious frame of the heart. Indeed, in contentment is a composition of all the graces. C.S. Lewis famously said that pride was the root of all sin. He's less famously known for saying, but contentment is the watershed of all virtue. Burroughs says, uh, to be well skilled in the mystery of contentment is the duty, the glory, and the excellency of a Christian. But it is a skill to be learned. Those that are thoroughly trained up in it have begun to resolve the Samson's riddle of the natural estate. You ever wrestled with that Samson's riddle? Lane Adams used to say, why, O oh Lord, is it taking so long for me to get better? It's the Samson's riddle of our lives. Jeremiah Burroughs goes on and he, he, he clarifies. He says that uh, contentment is not a natural stillness or native patience. We know people like that. They drive us crazy. <laughs> it is not a quiet disposition or a sturdy resolution or a strength of reason or complacency or even stoicism. It is being well pleased in what God does, in whatever God does. It is freely submitting to God's disposal of all things. Thus, a Christian comes to contentment not so much by way of addition as by way of subtraction. It's not how much we have that determines our contentment. I know this is counterintuitive because our contentment is almost always rooted in what we have. But according to the scriptures, contentment is rooted in who God is and what he has done. And our resting in that great and glorious provision. Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, I've learned in whatever situation I am in to be content. I know how to be brought low. And I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need, For I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And that's one of those verses that is wrenched out of context all the time. I I love the coffee mug that a friend of mine has that says, I can do all things through verses taken out of context. (laughs) (laughs) What Paul is saying here is that that we have a provision in the fully sufficient, finished work of Jesus Christ on our behalf. And that is the most significant, the most important thing in the resolution of our discontent. So in Hebrews we read, uh, keep your life free from the love of money. (laughs) Boy, easier said than done, right? And be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. That's why Paul would say to his young disciple Timothy, Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. If we have food and clothing, these, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich 
always fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Just go buy the latest People magazine, and you can see that. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It's through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. How do we keep the Eighth Commandment? Not only by the provision that God makes. As we pursue him in righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. Of course, the real problem is, so how? How how do we actually do that? Paul gives us a hint in Philippians chapter 3. There he says, look, if anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. And then he begins to detail all of the sevenfold Talmudic standards of righteousness that he has fulfilled. He says, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I was of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. But over and over again in our lives, we run into this conundrum. We get so caught up in all of the stuff that we don't have that we fail to see that, that, that the Lord has provided all that we need. We fail to see what we do have. In the sacrifice of Christ, that we are set free from the shackles of sin and death. In the perfect sacrifice of Christ, we are given the overflow of the Holy Spirit. In the perfect sacrifice of Christ, we have been given the power to walk by the Spirit in the way of holiness. In the perfect sacrifice of Christ, we have been given a glimpse of the Most High God who loves us with an everlasting love, whose steadfast love will never fail. What else do you want? But of course, as Burroughs points out, the truth is is that we, we have to train ourselves in the mystery of contentment. It's a duty, it's glory, it's the excellency of a Christian, but it's a skill that must be learned. So how do we learn it? Paul gives us the answer there in Philippians chapter 4. So let me just get very, very practical. 
We need to learn how to rest in his provision. We need to learn how to trust in Christ's providence. We need to learn how to walk in Christ's mercy. We need to learn how to remain in Christ's love. We need to learn how to rely on Christ's strength. So, here are a few exercises. Are you in his word every day? Drinking in his wisdom, drinking in his provision, seeing his very great and precious promises. If you're not, no wonder you're not content. Secondly, do do you take a daily habit of rehearsing and reviewing the character and nature of God? Do you look upon his holiness? Do you name his glorious attributes? Do you study his nature? Do you know who God is? Do you love him? Do you adore him? If not... No wonder you're not content. Third, do you on a daily basis give voice to and review all the things that God has done in your life? Count your many blessings. Name them one by one. Count your many blessings... See what God has done. It is a good thing at the end of every day to review and say, I wasn't looking for it, but here is where God met me. Here is where God kept me safe. Here is where God blessed me. Here is a word that came that that encouraged my heart, that lifted me up, that reminded me of the truth. Do you ever... You ever practice the discipline of keeping a, a gratitude journal? Uh, just get a regular calendar and, and every day uh, write down, what, what is it that God is doing? How is he doing it? How has he blessed me? Uh, raise up an Ebenezer in your own home And return to that Ebenezer, that rock of remembrance, over and over again when you're discouraged, when you're frustrated, when you don't know where else to turn. And remind yourself, if you don't do that on a daily basis, no wonder you're discontent. And the truth is, is that your discontented, restless hearts will inevitably lead to your thieving, manipulative hearts. Martin Luther put it this way. He said, contentment is the creation out of heaviness, joy. Out of terror, comfort. Out of sin, righteousness. Out of death, life. And out of darkness, light. How do we overcome our natural tendency to perpetually violate the Eighth Commandment with our discontent? We lay hold of We look upon, we remember again and again and again the glory and the majesty of the redemption that is ours because Jesus Christ was slain for sinners. Because Jesus Christ rescues us from the slave market of sin. He adopts us into his household. He calls us his beloved 
He makes us his own. Who could want anything more? That's the good news of the gospel. It changes everything. Thanks be to God. You shall not steal. This has been the Parish Presbyterian Church Sermon Podcast. For more information about the ministry of Parish Presbyterian Church, please visit www.parishpres.org.